Dispersion is also important in turbulent flow. And to see uh, how that works, let's start with this conceptual model shown here. We have a, a flow in a conduit, and we've got a velocity distribution here shown by these arrows. And this is a problem that we worked earlier in the course. And this velocity distribution alone would cause some uh, dispersion because particles that are closer to the center would move faster than particles closer to the wall. And so you would have longitudinal dispersion as a result of that. But in addition to that, in turbulent flow, we have these uh, eddies that are shown here. And those eddies are uh, flow are perturbations in the flow. Um, so the, the dark arrow we could think of as the average flow. And then there are also these perturbations that are caused by uh, eddies or vortices in the flow. And that's going to also contribute to dispersion. So to see how that works, let's start with this equation. This is an equation that we developed earlier. And what I'm going to do is assume that uh, the velocity is equal to uh, a mean velocity plus a variation. And this uh, fluctuation or variation in the velocity is uh, due to these uh, vortices. And similarly, the concentration equals a, a mean value or an average value uh, and a perturbation. So all I've done in this equation is to substitute in uh, these versions for the velocity and the concentration as, as equal to mean values plus perturbations. And so there's the concentration. It used to be that, and now it's that. OK, so that makes the equation longer, but it's just the simple substitution. And uh, then what I've done is rearrange things. And so uh, I take some terms over here on the left side. The equal sign is, is right here now. Um, and I've uh, grouped terms so that uh, th there are some red terms here. And uh, these terms are going to be um, uh, basically what we're going to do actually is uh, apply an average uh, of these fluctuations. So the uh, analysis consists of a continuum. And by doing that, we need to uh, be able to average, say, say we can think of it spatially as averaging over the, the finite element cell. And we're also going to average uh, in time as well. And so if we do that, we uh, can we take the second derivative of these perturbations, and uh, that goes to 0. And then uh, the average, uh, that's the mean velocity. And, but then if we average over these uh, perturbed concentrations uh, and the perturbed velocities, uh, those averages, the, the, they're, they're little fluctuations, but the fluctuations of the concentration and the velocity have zero as an average. So when we average them, uh, we, get, we get zero. Um, and similarly, these terms here uh, are zero. And uh, this term here, where the, the fluctuation and the concentration is changing with time, that's also equal to zero. Uh, so uh, those all go. Uh, and then what we do is, uh, is rewrite it. And we're going to have this term staying and that term staying uh, on, uh, on the right side. And on the left side, it's all the stuff that's, that I already put over there on the left side. OK? So I kind of, uh, from going from this first step to the, the second step here, uh, I kind of arranged things so that everything on the left I was going to keep, and I was going to do the, the, the work over on the right. And by doing that work, by taking the averages, what I end up with is this stuff here. OK, and what this says is the gradient of the product of the perturbed concentrations and the perturbed velocities. Uh, and this was in x, and this is in y. OK, and so if we take the average of that, because we're multiplying two perturbed values, the um, the, the product of two perturbed values doesn't necessarily average out to be 0. Uh, and so we use the same kind of argument when we were doing the, when we were developing the analysis for turbulent flow. But here, where we have transport in turbulent flow, uh, we come up with the same kind of thing, where this product of two perturbed values does not average out to be 0. 
So um, that that then stays. Now what we're going to say is this thing here. This is a perturbed concentration times a perturbed velocity in x, the small little fluctuation. So concentration times velocity that has uh, units of uh, mass flux. And so what I'm going to say is that uh, the mass flux from these perturbations equals a constant times the concentration gradient in, in x. And, and here that we have a velocity going in y, a perturbed velocity in y, and that's going to equal a, a, a constant ey times this uh, concentration gradient in, in y. Okay, so that then will allow me to substitute basically these terms here are going to go in there. And if I do that, then I have the, the gradient in x of this term here. And that's going to give me, um, well, then what I can do is, is carry this uh, gradient through. And uh, if, if, if E is um, uniform, then I just get a second derivative in uh, C. And after the substitution, what I get is that term there times that term there is what I get out of that. And that term there times that is what I get out of that. Okay, so that's the argument. Um, this has the, the same kind of form as Fick's law, and it's the same form that we saw earlier for uh, dispersive flux. And so what we get then is uh, is this term here and this term here, and these are akin to the hydrodynamic dispersion terms that we saw earlier, where we've got a molecular dif diffusion and a dispersion term that's due to fluctuations in the flow velocity. Okay, so that's pretty nice because this, if we just lump that all together and call it D, and or, or D hydrodynamic, so we lump all that together in D and lump all that together in D, then uh, we have something that, that, that gives us this same equation. It gives us the advection dispersion equation, where in this case n now is equal to 1. And d is now defined differently than what, the way we used to define it, because it has this uh, dispersion due to the fluctuations in uh, concentration and in velocity that we get resulting from these turbulent eddies. OK, so. Here's the, the crux of it. We've got these two terms that are the um, dispersion due to turbulence. The, the D here is the turbulent dispersion constant. It's going to have uh, units of uh, D times V, or a characteristic length times a characteristic uh, velocity. And if we think about it, you know, here's Here's the, uh, uh, the Carmen vortices problem, and uh, we see we see these uh, these vortices here, and here's one, and I don't know. We might think of of this as one, uh, and maybe this is a little one, uh, and so these vortices are now defining a a size scale. So if we think of that as a, as a vortice, and that uh, diameter there as a, a length scale, then it would make sense, I think, to have uh, that length scale be associated with d in the turbulent dispersion. And this v would be the, the velocity that, is the, that the fluid is taking around the, the turbulent vortices. Okay, so we can make a, a, a reasonable, um, uh, I guess, conceptual model for what the turbulent dispersion um, term should be. Uh, it should be associated with the size of the vortices and with the velocities. Now what's going to happen is that uh, there'll be a variety of vortices of different sizes and so the one that is the biggest is uh, going to give us the biggest D and have the most impact on the overall process. 
So that's that'll be important to consider. Um, the other thing is, though, that we we only want to consider vortices that we're not actually analyzing and we're not actually predicting in the flow. You know, in some cases, we we predict vortices in the flow. The we can have, we predict large ones. Um, and in that case, we, we have the flow, it's varying, and when we have uh, dispersion or when we have concentration in that flow, it'll get, um, it'll get mixed and the concentration will change as a result of the, the different velocity distributions uh, within the vortex. And uh, so those large vortices, we wouldn't really lump into uh, this D. It's only going to be the smaller ones that we're not explicitly analyzing for. Okay, so um, there are a variety of ways of estimating uh, this uh, mechanical dispersion term in turbulent flows or, or in, in flows of fluid. And I'm summarizing a couple of them here. Here's laminar flow in a pipe. Uh, and in this case, this is the molecular diffusion. And, uh, and this is the, essentially the, the um, mechanical dispersion term. And so you know, it has the molecular diffusion in it here. And that's because when you have a, a laminar flow and you have the, uh, the, the velocity is changing with distance, then uh, if you have two particles that start out next to one another uh, and they're, they're now separated, then this particle is going to tend to diffuse that way. Uh, and this one will tend to diffuse that way. And that diffusion will tend to, to limit the dispersion. So that's why you have D here in the denominator. The rest of these, well, th this one is for uh, turbulence in a pipe. Uh, so similar to laminar flow, except for turbulent conditions, both in pipes. And um, this now is going to um, relate the D to uh, the radius of the pipe and uh, this thing. This is uh, this is the um, shear velocity, it's called, um, and uh, this is the shear stress at the wall, and this is the density of the fluid, and it's all raised to one half. Okay, so we said that it uh, that the um, the dispersion should be related to the velocity, but in this case. It's related to a, a term that has units of velocity, the shear velocity, um, but it doesn't actually uh, consist of an actual velocity. It's this shear stress at the wall. So if you have, uh, if you've got flow like this, it's uh, it's it's the shear stress that that is occurring right here at the wall. Um, and so that's going to be an important control on D. Uh, in porous media, D is uh, equal to the um, molecular diffusion times this alpha term, the, the dispersivity, and here's the velocity. So you can see uh, length term velocity, length term velocity. Here's an infinitely wide channel. It's uh, the depth of the channel times the shear velocity. Um, vertical mixing in a stream, um, similarly the depth of the stream, the shear velocity, and then longitudinal dispersion in a stream. This is a little more complicated, but there's a W squared, there's the velocity squared, and then there's the shear velocity, and then there's the depth. Okay, so this has the right units, but it, it has a little bit more complicated expressions. Okay, so here are some ways that you can come up with D, uh, the dispersion in, um, in pipes and in streams. And this will be important because it'll give us a path forward then for applying the advection dispersion equation in, in these kinds of, of settings. Now, one thing that I would point out here is that, uh, that D, it's, it's generally, uh, it's proportional to the uh, characteristic length and velocity. Uh, so in these problems, you know, this is the depth of the water, um, the radius of a pipe. So L, you know, a typical value for L might be, say, approximately one meter. And um, velocities, well, velocities in streams, 
you know, it could be, you could have a velocity of, of one meter per second. Uh, so the velocity could be one uh, meter per second. And so that gives us a, a, a d of one meter squared per second. Okay, so what, we, what we're seeing here is that uh, this dm, it behaves the same as, um, as dispersion in porous media, and it behaves the same in equations as diffusion. But when we go and work out what the magnitude of this term is, we get something like that for this example. And recall that the, the, diff, the diffusion through water of an ion is about that. Okay, so about one billion times smaller than the dispersion that we would have in this turbulent flow. So you can see pretty clearly that when you have turbulence that probably molecular diffusion is going to play only a very small role. And what I have here to wrap things up is just some summary of values of D uh, for different settings, rivers, lakes, and the ocean. And so this is in the same units meter squared per second. And you can see that here it's around one, but in a longitudinal dispersion, it could be very much greater than one. And uh, lakes uh, can, can be fairly small. Um, if the if the lake is really quiescent, um, but it also could get up to be approximately one, and then in the ocean, uh, it spans a wide range, but it can be uh, it can be very large, uh, very large indeed in the in the ocean. Okay, so just uh, I want to point out here this is a problem that you've you're going to be doing for homework, and this shows or this is actually for lab, and this shows an example of a plume in a lake where the dispersion in the lake ends up being important. And here we see a river. This is the Grand River in Michigan. And uh, this is a river that's uh, eroded a lot of sediment uh, up here. And uh, it's flowing out and dumping it out into um, Lake Michigan. And there's this, uh, the, this uh, levee here that's or it's like a jetty um, that's kind of like a tube. But that, it's pretty wide. It's, it's pretty wide right here. Um, and but th this is like a jetty, like a wall built out into Lake Michigan, and so the sediments come out here like this, and then there's flow in this direction in the lake, and you can see this plume of uh, of muddy water that forms like that. Um, okay, so what's happening is the the water's flowing in from this river, and then we have a plume, and we've got dispersion that happens. Uh, in the downstream direction uh, that is a result of the, these turbulent eddies. And so here's the, I changed the color, I fiddled around with the, the color processing to show this plume a little bit better. And then here's a simulation uh, that you'll do for lab uh, of this plume uh, being injected into Lake Michigan.